Welcome to the 2020 Public Health Law Virtual Summit. We have two presentations in this session, and each presentation will be followed by a Q&A. Use the chat feature to submit your question. If you encounter technical difficulties, go to the navigation menu and select Need Help button. Now I'll turn it over to our first speaker. Okay, um, good afternoon or good morning, perhaps even good night, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, I'm Evan Anderson, I'm delighted to kick this off. And uh, I'm gonna be sort of uh, starting us off and a little discussion of some work that Scott and I did. Uh, our work aimed to try to understand uh, what research has been conducted evaluating uh, legal interventions aimed at addressing the COVID-19 crisis. Needless to say, this is a large, continuously evolving and almost exponentially growing body of evidence. So um, it's gonna be hard for us to um, comprehensively review that whole body in, in 20 minutes. Um, nevertheless, we really hope um, that uh, you can pull out some uh, valuable insights and also that we can stimulate some good discussions for the, um, for the time that we'll, we'll leave at the end. We each have two or three slides and then we plan on, on leaving lots of time for discussion. So, um, Hi, this is Harris again from Pathable. That was an incorrect number, 313-577-4816. Uh, Lance is on in any case. Lance is on. Yeah, Never mind. we're a lot here too. It didn't let me in until 1.15, so I don't know why. Okay, it's all right, we're on. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so delighted that Lance has joined us and we're gonna just keep pressing on here. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about um, Scott and my work, kind of reviewing what's been done um, so far. Um, just getting my screen set up here, apologies. And, uh, you know, I wanna start with a couple fairly obvious takeaways, but, you know, hopefully still provide some important context for the, for the rest of our remarks. The first is that there has been a lot of legal intervention. So just a few moments ago, I uh, pulled up the website for NCSL, the National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, and they have a handy database of COVID-19 related laws. And uh, they have over 3,000 uh, entries in their database of proposed or adopted laws related to COVID-19. Obviously, that's only in the last year. Um, because we've only been in the crisis so long. That's a lot of, you know, that's a lot of legislative activity. Underscoring again that um, public health law is really important and popular um, addressing public health problems. Along the same lines, there has been an enormous amount of research. So, you know, just again, to sort of orient you to the volume, I did a very similar study a few moments ago, just in Google Scholar, where I plugged in you know, quotations, stay at home order, end quotations. So just looking for that term returns over 3,000 studies uh, in 2020. That's an amazing amount of studies. Um, you know, it would be hard to sort of read and characterize those within one field, but they actually exist across a wide array of fields and across um, a diverse collection of journals and you know, sort of publication statuses. So many of those are peer reviewed, many of them aren't. They exist in this sort of preliminary or early review st status uh, in, a, in a database. Um, again, just sort of overall. Evan, um, yeah. just to say, are you meaning to share slides? Because we're oh, yeah. not seeing any slides. Oh, uh, interesting. Sorry. This is frozen here for a second. Let's see. Let me, I'm going to close out of my sharing and share it again. How's it work now? Yes. Now okay. we got it. All right. Apologies again. So uh, here we are pressing along. Um, lots of law, lots of research, um, some you know high level characteristics of the research. Very few experiments. You know, we haven't had very many or really any substantial um, randomized trials of law. You know, those are done sometimes, they're hard to do. There have been essentially none in, in this instance. 
Um, there have also been very few quasi experiments. So the sort of bread and butter of public health law research or one of the classic designs that has powered a lot of what we know about the effects of law, you know, relies on our federal system of government where states and localities can experiment with laws. Um, and it, it looks at trends in outcomes over time for populations that are covered by the law and not covered by the law. Classic example would be you know, child restraint laws where you know, late 70s states started to require children under four years old to be in uh, safety devices in cars. You know, researchers were able to make confident assessments about the effects of those laws by following trends in child fatalities for children under four, subject to the law, and then comparing them to children, uh, you know, ages four and five uh, over time. And you could follow those trends and, and you could look in adjacent states. Um, and over a period of years, researchers would understand the sort of seasonality and these long-term trends. Uh, that type of approach is really hard in this current moment because on the one hand, this is our first season of COVID-19. We don't really know what the effects of summer are in COVID-19 uh, because you know, this is our first summer, obviously. Um, data, you know, in other areas, we've had really detailed data um, that we could link up with our, with our legal interventions to understand their effects. We don't have the same type of accessible individual level data about COVID-19 infections. Uh, and then finally, you know, the relationship between the law uh, and the outcome is a little harder. You know, when you wear a seatbelt, that has a very individualized effect on your survival in a crash. Uh, many of our interventions with COVID-19, you know, deal with externalities. My mask protects you, your mask protects me. Sort of understanding the effects of compliance or, or sort of laws that aim at a certain behavior are hard when you can't tie that behavior to an individual person. Um, many of the studies that have been done um, have relied on simulations. Because we can't you know, exploit these natural experiments, we sort of simulate them. Um, these have been characterized you know, as helpful but wrong in the, in the sort of um, noteworthy language of a particular New England Journal of Medicine uh, editorial. Um, you know, basically the, the sort of most common way that these simulations are designed is a sort of compartmental or mechanistic design, which is separate the population into these buckets. We've got most people who are susceptible, which is to say that they could get COVID-19, but they haven't yet. We have folks who are exposed and some proportion of those people who are exposed become infectious and symptomatic. And then some proportion of those folks then end up um, leaving the population at risk either because they recover and they're immune or um, they pass away and, and they leave the population. Um, you know, the point here that, you know, I just like to underscore is that, you know, we're still learning about the basic science of COVID-19. So understanding the legal effects in these types of simulation studies really also relies on our ability to understand those other relationships between the buckets. You know, we as legal interventionists are sort of symbolized by the little jackhammer there trying to break the relationship between people who are susceptible and people who are exposed. Um, but in terms of doing our outcome evaluations, you know, we, we sort of rely on these other phenomena that are still uncertain that we're still learning about. Um, it's been very popular and, and very powerful learning about other, other infectious diseases. Um, but only once we've had a critical mass of information to be able to reasonably understand how those buckets um, play together. So, you know, I'm gonna pass it over to Scott in, in five or six minutes, but you know, what, what do we know? You know, looking at the studies that we have, what, what can we reasonably say? Um, you know, some of the takeaways are, are pretty obvious and you almost don't need research to do them, right? Closing, you know, laws that close schools um, it's a pretty simple intervention that has um, a pretty obvious mechanism of effect. Um, and when you say, hey, the schools have to close, they close. Less people congregate and, and that prevents some amount of infection, right? Same thing to some extent with travel bans. You know, if you prevent people from entering a population where the, um, where the, the COVID-19 isn't, isn't there yet, well, of course, that's gonna, that's gonna keep infection down for a little while. 
the question is, you know, in part, uh, can you sustain them? What are the incidental effects of these? How are, how are the benefits and the costs distributed? And are there lower touch ways to have the same effects? Um, the, um, the other point I want to just make here is that, you know, when we look at other interventions, uh, broadly speaking, um, I think it's safe to say that, you know, we, we've observed a temporal relationship between, um, broadly speaking, between laws and less infection which is to say sort of more legal interventions have tended to result or tended to associate temporally with less infections. Um, it's really tricky though to isolate the effect of any one particular intervention uh, in any one particular place for three reasons. One, context dependence. Um, we know from global research, research from other countries that you know, an intervention that works really well when prevalence is a half of 1% might not work as well when prevalence gets to 5%. Um, contingency, um, contract tracing is an essential part of our response. Uh, and you might have really good laws and a really thoughtful approach with respect to distancing. But if you can't do the testing, which we've failed at you know, in, in many ways here, that's a, a sort of a contingency that makes it hard to really evaluate the, the distancing approach. And finally, the sort of endogeneity approach, you know, we, that just speaks to the idea that we've gotten to a point where we're using broad approaches. Um, and in some, in some ways, you, know, you might argue less narrow, uh, less narrowly tailored approaches than we might otherwise. We haven't arrived there um, sort of randomly. We've sort of gotten there in, in large part through um, an experience of repeated failures. And we've taken on broader and broader and more and more aggressive legal strategies have less, as less tailored approaches, more tailored approaches have failed. Um, you know, one obvious effect of that has been um, incredible disparities in outcomes. And this is something that was not a feature of the sort of first wave of research. First wa wave of research largely focused on your sort of average population effect, your mean effect, where there are fewer infections at the population level. Um, at this point, and if you look over the last couple months, there is uh, much more attention to um, heterogeneous treatment effects. The idea that laws can benefit some people while harming others. And that's important because one thing we know is that there are just tremendous and horrifying disparities in the outcomes that we've observed. So that's a, um, a very important development that's um, you know much more common in the, the research wave that's even sort of come out since we, uh, since we wrote up our results. Um, I'm at my 10 minute limit. I actually think I shaved a minute off for Scott. So Scott, you wanna, you wanna take it from there? Thanks very much, Evan. Um, next slide, if you please. Sure. So, you know, one way to think about how to manage the, the challenge of trying to figure out what works in real time and to make real policy decisions based on this imperfect information is to just start with, with basic behavioral theory, as it were, legal theory, um, and, and, and ask what would have to be true for measures to work. Um, and we, we applied this uh, in, our, in our review um, pretty strongly because there was so little evidence. So, so some of these building blocks, the starting building block is that people understand what it is we want them to do. They know they should stay at home. They know they should get a test. They know they should wash their hands or wear a mask, whatever it might be. Because um, if they don't know what they're supposed to do, it doesn't matter what the law says. Um, of course, once they understand what they're supposed to do, um, it's, <laughs> a lot of this is about them realizing why that's a good idea and being willing to comply. People who think, that it's stupid to wear a mask, or indeed, because COVID is just a myth, or think that wearing a mask signals that you're a weak need East Coast snowflake liberal, um, betraying your political, your political group, uh, they're not going to wear a mask, right? Um, once you have people willing to do and understanding why they should do, there are material necessities that have to be in place for them to be able to comply. So with a mask, you have to be able to get a mask. 
Uh, <clears throat> if you're asked to stay at home, you need some assurance that you'll be able to pay your rent while you're in lockdown. If you're asked to keep your distance from people and, 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 and or stay away from work if you're sick, if you don't have sick leave, how, how are you actually able to do that and still deal with the other pressing demands on your life? That's one of the big reasons, of course, we have disparities in outcomes in COVID is that we have disparities in the ability, the material capacity to comply. At, at the top is enforcement, but that's sort of half the size. And I don't know if that's drawn to scale just because, um, you know, we, we have seen a little bit of ticketing and a little bit of, of sort of police busting up um, you know, frat parties and so on. But, but by and large, we have depended upon um, individuals and organizations to comply voluntarily. And, and, and that's pretty inevitable. If you have a law around a COVID emergency that, that only works if we have police out there making sure everybody complies, we're not likely to have a high level of compliance. Um, we just don't have enough police. Next slide, please. Now let's turn it around and kind of ask what the literature and the experience so far tells us about, about the availability of those conditions. So if we think about what, what, what the building blocks of successful response look like um, and compare that with the building blocks of, of compliance with, with, with pandemic law, well, we, we see where we, why we're having a bit of a problem. I mean, fundamentally, the first and most important building block is what we might call leadership that we are getting clear, consistent, accurate measure, messages about the risks um, and about the right response from, from all of our leaders, not just the president, but the governor and the, the mayor and the pastor and the professor and the president of the college and the chair of the, C the CEO of the company. We all have to be speaking off the same playbook, which in past epidemics has generally been written by the CDC. Um, and that's another problem we have, because instead of being a source of, of both good science and robust practical guidance that's credible, CDC has become um, something that most of us have never thought we would see, a, a kind of political mouthpiece organization with limited credibility that can't keep a consistent message going for more than a couple of weeks. Uh, those are the big failures. Um, when you think about what it takes to get people to, to know what they should do and to do it. Um, when it comes to the ability to comply, having the material resources you need, uh, funding from Congress um, and to both power the local response and to meet the economic disaster uh, that has come from COVID. Well, Congress started off with I would say a pretty robust response. When you start talking about trillions of dollars, pretty soon that gets to be real money. Um, but as we've seen that, that, that progress or that action has, has ground to a halt and we're now kind of watching a slow moving depression creep across um, our communities. An odd one because some people feel nothing and other people feel a huge amount, but as cities run out of money and as uh, the economic ripple, ripple effects start to happen, more and more people are going to start to, to, to feel this suffering and maybe that will, will spur some action. But for the moment, we don't have all we need in that respect. Well, then if you have the game plan and you have the resources to execute the game plan, you still have to have um, the effective implementation by, by the implementers, by the state and local health departments uh, doing case finding control and so on. As Evan has already talked about, uh, that, has not, that has not been present in part because of immediate lack of resources and in part because of the long-term hollowing out of the public health infrastructure. There just aren't people um, who have the experience, training and resources to do what they need to do at the scale that is required of them. They're just not powered for this scale. Um, and then the, at the end of all that, you've got a population. And I have to say, I, although I still give this a color yellow, you know, meaning kind of not quite green, but, but not red, um, you know, by and large, the population has done what it, what it needs to do. Um, we have notable exceptions, but, but we've seen in lots of parts of the country, people undertaking real voluntary change when they can do it. Um, and I think if the, the rest of the building blocks have been in place, we'd see something better. Um, next uh, slide, please. 
So what are we looking at for round two besides a trimmed off slide here? Um, well, you know, we are heading into round two. There's no question about it. We're heading into the fall, high levels of, of um, prevalence in many places. Uh, what are we going to have to see? Well, what the evidence tells us is that the, the, the closure of, of activity, stopping activity, schools, businesses, offices, um, that can be effective when you have nothing more precise to do. Um, physical distancing and, and trying to make sure that we limit the, the crowd gatherings of big crowds as networks, um, that seems to work. Um, and finally, you know, basic hand hygiene and mask wearing, those things um, all matter. As Evan says, we don't know what the right mix is. And we certainly know that doing everything all at once is a huge burden. And if we can find ways to be more localized um, and more nuanced, that would be good. But those are going to be guesses. Uh, when should we do it? Well, that's a little clearer. Don't wait. Um, and we're always, and you know, we, 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 you got to hit early. Um, and every week you don't hit when you have a rising curve is, is going to make a higher curve and a longer curve. Um, and keep it going. Um, ideally, I think what looks like it might be at least behaviorally effective is to, tr at least in some places, is to try and set some targets so that everybody understands where we have to get in order to um, start pulling back on whatever restrictions we have. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the, 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 this is the, the, the real scientific takeaway, um, which is that uh, we have kind of lost this battle, just like Rocky lost his bout, but um, we still have a chance to lose it with, you know, with, with a kind of uh, dignity and with a kind of effectiveness that will give us a place to start with for the, for the rest of our sequels. Um, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna be ugly, um, but you know, if, if, if this you know, lug from Philadelphia could do it in the movies, why can't we do it um, in real life? Um, and it's true. It's I, I, this is a this is a open. This is a, somebody said Adriana. It's Adrian, which is absolutely true. But I got this off of a you know Creative Commons open source sort of picture thing. So um, I had to take what I could get. <laughs> so now we've we we're done with our piece. Um, as far as uh, uh, talking to you is concerned, we'd love to get any questions you have if you want you know, anything to be covered more deeply or if um, you'd like to add your opinions. Um, and we, can, we can't put you on live, but we can read your opinions. Um, and we have a question, which is, uh, what should we be doing to get better data on the effectiveness of law and COVID-19 response? Um, well, I'll take the first half of that and then hand it over to Evan. I'm sure he has a view of the second half. I mean, the first big challenge, um, which we undertook at our center at, at Temple, was, has been to actually properly measure the plethora of law um, so that we can start to have the independent variable for that evaluation. Um, I'm thinking also that we're likely to um, still be heavily reliant on models because we don't have the ability to get um, uh, to get to get the natural experiments or the data that fully in place that we need for for true um, um, quasi experimental evaluations. Evan, you want to add something? You're on mute, though. You got to unmute. Apologies, I was trying to get my way to the to the chat there. Um, I think it's really important to to systematize too to to um, create systems so not only that the data is accessible, but that it's easy to make comparisons across places and time, um, which is something that we can, you know, there's a lot of work to be, to be done there. Um, I missed the first part of your question, but I, I trust it was, I trust it was good if we want to <laughs> move on. Well, the question is like, where do we get, you know, what about getting better data ah. um, uh, on the, uh, on, on the, uh, on what's going on? Yeah. Um, a lot of the data that's been done so far has been almost syndromic, you know, where it's looking at um, it's looking at data sources like cell phone activity to try to understand 
uh, people's movement and how often people are congregating. It'd be really important to also start to, and there's some of this, but to also do, um, to do work where you actually, you know, ask people and you survey people about their behavior and try to understand how that behavior is changing. I think, you know, understanding people's appreciation for the law, we're, we're coming up on this big, you know, hopefully soon issue with having a vaccine, you know, if there, if there are legal requirements or inducements, you know, we, we want to understand how we can address vaccine hesitancy. We want the law to run with rather than against um, that very challenging issue. So I think that's something that we have to explore. Right. So I mean, I think quality, that kind of qualitative research is really important. I mean, we do have fundamental data problems in the sense that we don't even have a clear system for CDC to get and produce, or we, I'm not quite sure who is supposed to be getting and producing and sharing the basic COVID data. Um, and, and of course, with unreliable testing and somewhat broken health data systems, we don't have the um, data that we ought to have. Now, I just, I just have been working with some people in Switzerland who are trying to track the response there. And it's a small country, granted, and all that sort of stuff, but they have every case within 24 hours of detection in a database um, properly anonymized that they can use in their research. So they have the big data as it were right there. Whereas uh, I don't know if we'll ever have fully accurate data about what's going on with COVID, but we have states adding two or 300 cases two or three weeks later. Um, you know, deaths, two or 300 deaths. There's other, you know, really major data problems that reflect the underlying weakness of our public health system. Information systems are terrible. You know, we've, you're, numerous, numerous reports of people getting, you know, they're supposed to be doing contact tracing, say, from people arriving on flights from China who get indecipherable fax messages with um, the identification information so they can't do it even if they, even if they have the, the resources. Um, you know, so, so I think, yeah, data is, is at the heart of the problem of evaluation in this instance, and it's going to beset us throughout. Um, Evan, it was mentioned that, that, that we have moved to broader approaches for dealing with, with COVID-19 because more narrow uh, traditional approaches have failed. Um, do you have any examples handy of, of more narrowly tailored legal responses and why they failed? Um, you, can, you can certainly think of a, um, a number of other countries that had vigorous testing. So, you know, there, there are a number of countries where, um, you know, people would be tested every time they went into their building. And then there was, you know, broad approval and public support backed by enforcement in places like Singapore. Um, for then people to be distanced and provided with all the needs to, to, to be distanced. Um, that's a sort of narrow individualized approach. Here, you know, we could never think to do that, right? Instead, we sort of, you know, we have to close, basically close everything down, um, which is a really blunt tool. And the one thing we know from a lot of legal research is that, you know, when you, when you intervene broadly at the population level, um, that tends to benefit people who are advantaged and it often has negative effects for people who are disadvantaged. Um, so, you know, if we were able to, to do really rigorous testing, we could have taken a more individualized approach. Right. I mean, I think, you know, basically we can, if you're just trying to keep it really simple, we'd say, well, ideally when you have a, an outbreak coming in, what we expected to have happened, what we thought was going to happen in January was that, um, we would be knowing, we would be very tightly controlling people coming into the country, anybody who had been to China um, or had been to a country, of course the problem was that we had people going to Europe and then China, but trying to track down any kind of risk, um, testing people, tracking people we tested, when we started to have community transmission, getting right on, the, on those initial cases and throwing resources into the contact tracing and supporting the quarantine. And you hope then that you never get a large scale outbreak. You kind of just keep getting these little flare ups and you can um, But we missed the first boat 
you know, we had lots of cases before we knew we had any, which was in part because this is a damn tough virus to stop and things were happening fast. And in part because the level of seriousness uh, was not there. Um, and in part because the level of capacity was not there. You know, in some of these famous incidents early on in the epidemic, there's an MMWR study r report of people um, of California authorities getting incomplete and unusable information from federal border officials so that they couldn't do contact tracing and management of people coming in from China. There's a story of, uh, you know, a whole airplane load of people coming back from China that, you know, Governor Cuomo, you know, promised to trace who were never traced because the health department just didn't have the capacity. Um, so, you know, you, most of what we've done since is a study of what happens when, when the basic stuff fails. Um, and just as to finish up, we do have sort of a similar question with international law and the lack of national databases and coding questions. We would love to say more about that. We'll try and answer in the chats. Um, but meanwhile, it's time to turn this over to Professor Lance Gable from Wayne State, who is going to take us out into a, a completely different topic. Lance, over to you. <laughs> okay, can you all hear me? Okay, good. Um... Yes, yeah, now for something completely different. Um, I am just gonna share my screen here. Okay, hopefully that is something you all can see. All right, so um, my, my topic of discussion here is going to be um, looking at allocation of scarce medical resources and crisis standards of care. And, you know, we're going from the, the comments that Scott and Evan just made, um, looking at the really big picture issues that kind of are, you know, cross-cutting assessment of how law, how law worked or didn't work in terms of our response. This is going to be focusing on one particular aspect of our response and, and actually a particular aspect of our response that fortunately has not needed to be fully invoked so far, because even though uh, at the beginning of this pandemic back in, in March and April, there were a lot of concerns that our healthcare systems and our capacity to treat people who were, who were sick uh, was just going to be completely overwhelmed. Um, you know, fortunately, we were able to make it through that time period without the worst case scenarios playing out, in part because of all of the interventions we were just talking about. The, the mass stay-at-home orders, business closures, gathering restrictions, all those kinds of initiatives really were um, uh, a big part of being able to flatten that curve and you know, drive down some of the hospitalization rates. Um, I, I also wanted to mention, and, and, and so here, here's the overview here. So we're, we're, I'm gonna talk about allocating scarce resources when uh, dealing with an emergency like COVID-19 we're going to talk about, uh, first of all, what mechanisms are available and potentially uh, useful in avoiding scarcity in the first place. Uh, talking about also what happens when uh, the situation requires uh, the, the use of crisis standards of care. Uh, and then uh, focusing on two particular legal issues, uh, liability for decisions made about how to allocate scarce resources, and also um, how civil rights and anti-discrimination uh, laws protect against uh, certain approaches to allocating resources that might disadvantage uh, certain groups of people. Uh, and then I wanna end with talking a little bit about some of the recommendations that we made in the report. And so for, for those of you that have been following along, um, you all know that, that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we released this report assessing the legal responses to COVID-19. It's, uh, and it covers in great detail um, just over 35 different chapters, 36 chapters actually, uh, looking at different aspects of legal response to COVID-19 with over 100 uh, specific recommendations. And so if you haven't already checked out the report, I would uh, definitely uh, uh, encourage you to do so uh, because you'll, you'll get a lot of this information in greater detail. So um, let's start with this. So obviously there are, num uh, uh, there are numerous factors that can lead to scarcity during a pandemic. Um, and COVID-19 is, is sort of a great case study in how this can happen. 
uh, you have a new disease in this case, an infectious disease that's spreading rapidly. It's spreading pre-symptomatically, and so people are infecting others before they know they're, they're sick, before they have symptoms themselves. Um, and as we saw uh, first in China, then in, in Italy, and then in New York City, um, th those caseloads can rapidly increase to the point where people are being hospitalized in great numbers, and th there's the potential for overwhelming the capacity of the healthcare system. And you know, fortunately in New York City, while um, the, the capacity was stretched nearly to the breaking point, and, and in fact in some parts of the city was stretched beyond the breaking point, um, the, 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 the ability to expand capacity and to adapt was, and also the, the other interventions that, that, that reduced the, the rate of infection over the, you know, a few month period, uh, were, were, were really helpful in avoiding that system being overwhelmed. This is still quite a, a, a significant concern when we talk about the ongoing pandemic because there are lots of communities um, in other parts of this country and also in other parts of the world where uh, the capacity not only can be easily overwhelmed with the surge and influx of cases, but also can uh, not as easily be um, expanded to, to add additional capacity. Um, another thing that, that goes on often at the, at the outset of a pandemic or when a pandemic worsens is that you, know, you have people who are sick or people who are caring for other people who are sick um, or who are just distancing to try to prevent themselves from becoming sick, who are either unable to provide work and, and people who work in the healthcare system might not be able to, to actually come and help people, which diminishes, diminishes the capacity even further. Um, and indeed, um, providing caregiving or the inability to do so um, is a big factor in, in our health system capacity, even beyond uh, just people being sick and having to, having to, to stay home while they're recovering. And, and it's also finally um, a fundamental reality of our existing system here in this country that we, we don't have a, a resilient system. We don't have typically reserves of supplies um, certainly within individual hospitals or healthcare settings, uh, most of our operations are done on a just-in-time basis. You know, pe people buy the supplies when they need them. Uh, to the extent that there's any reserve, um, that reserve is, is not kept uh, in, in any great numbers and it's, and it's easily depleted. And so we're not set up well for these kinds of scenarios. And so, and obviously uh, here I'm focusing on medical resources and services, but these issues have broader implications for scarcity in other sectors, including food scarcity and things like that, which I'm not gonna touch on in this talk. Um, so as I already mentioned, you know, we saw this huge influx of patients in the hardest hit areas starting in, in February, March, and April of, of this year, uh, which stretched our systems uh, to near or beyond capacity. Uh, we saw shortages in a number of different kinds of medical resources, including ventilators, including actual rooms where people, patients could be treated, um, shortages of medications, and the shortages of medications have fluctuated over time, and especially as certain experimental medications have been touted and um, have been put out uh, for potential use, we've seen shortages in, you know, fluctuate in some of those supplies as well. Uh, shortages in personnel, you know, people, one of the, one of the big, uh, shortages early in the New York City outbreak was that uh, even in hospitals where they had a sufficient number of ventilators, there weren't always enough uh, trained professionals to be able to administer and, and use those, uh, those devices appropriately. And so, you know, having to expand uh, the scope of practice of some healthcare uh, providers was something that needed to be done. And then also, uh, and very uh, notably, shortages of personal protective equipment, uh, which made it more dangerous for uh, people who are working in hospitals and in other essential jobs to, to come to work safely and, and not be exposed to COVID-19 themselves. And so um, while the, and, and again, you know, the, I, I hope to see if Scott and Evan agree with this assessment uh, based on, on their analysis of the data, but um, it, it does seem like the worst case scenarios, which, which would have been uh, you know, having our system completely overwhelmed, people just being turned away at the door because there are no uh, no more supplies to treat them and no more, no more capacity to treat them. That didn't happen, although we came pretty close, I think, in some, in some of the, the hardest hit jurisdictions. And so, again, um, how do we avoid this going forward and what can, what can be done to try to avoid this kind of scarcity? So, um, for starters, one thing that can be done um, and, and has been done to some extent uh, over the preceding decade or decade and a half is to plan for this kind of contingency situation. Uh, what do we do if we run into shortages uh, related to a pandemic? Uh, 
uh, how do we expand capacity? How do we alter the way that we use our resources so that we can stretch them over a, a, a broader range of patients? And, 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 and that sort of planning has been, has been in the works for, for quite a number of years in a lot of places, you know, at the state level, at the federal level, even within individual healthcare um, institutions and organizations. That being said, having a plan is not enough. You actually have to implement the plan. You have to have people who understand what the plan is. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of these plans were developed in 2009 and 2010 after the last potential flu pandemic, and they've just been put on a shelf and have been uh, kind of filed away, and the people who developed them might not even be working for those institutions or in those organizations anymore. And so um, making sure that the planning is actually continually available and relevant is something that, that is, is important in, in avoiding scarcity. Um, also, having protocols in place that allow for um, coordination uh, across institutions and across uh, geographic areas. And so th this is something that actually did eventually happen in New York City when there was a real scarcity in certain supplies. The, the state uh, coordinated with the city and coordinated with the hospital systems in the city to come up with a strategy to fairly allocate the limited resources that were available for things like ventilators. Um, and then there's also the, the, the possibility of bringing in, uh, of expanding capacity through manufacturing and through use of um, shared federal resources. And so the, the federal government has developed the strategic national stockpile, uh, which has been in place now for you know, over 15 years, uh, designed to do exactly this, to stock extra amounts of, of, of needed medical supplies and devices uh, that can then be distributed as needed during an emergency. Um, the SNS was used to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, especially in March and April, but it was used um, erratically. There, 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 there were definitely some delays and some, uh, some uh, prioritization to uh, people who were better connected with the, with the Trump administration. And there was a lot of allegations of problems with how that actually uh, was administered. And then um, th there's no indication that uh, the kinds of resources needed to replenish that supply have been, have been allocated since. And so as we're going into the fall, where we're worried about a second wave of, of uh, the, the pandemic, we're, or, or perhaps the third wave, depending on, on how we're characterizing waves here, um, we're seeing that those supplies, many, many of them are still in shortage. So we still don't have enough PPE for everyone who needs it. We haven't used the Defense, Defense Production Act, which is a, an option that's available at the federal level to compel a sufficient number of tests or PPE or, or other needed supplies. And so we're still facing the prospect of shortages if the cases again spike to uh, greater levels than, than than we're seeing at the moment. And so this is something that this is a problem that we can solve. We have some mechanisms to solve, but we haven't gotten there yet. Now, um, and I, I wanted to highlight a couple of aspects that many of these, these uh, scarcity avoidance plans have. Uh, a, a lot of them draw from uh, federal guidance, which was developed about 10 years ago uh, by the Institute of Medicine, and which is now the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and this, uh, this guidance and, and some of the reporting that came out at the time, upon which many states have developed their report, um, looks at standards of care in a couple of different categories. Uh, you know, conventional capacity is what the normal circumstances uh, require and uh, the expectations that exist under those normal circumstances. Um, when those circumstances start to deteriorate because of uh, strain on the system, uh, you might have to move to what's known as contingency capacity, where you have to start changing um, how you're using some of the resources or, or go into kind of alternative adaptive strategies to respond. And then finally, um, if you get to the, the more extreme shortages, you, you may end up in, in the crisis standards of care, where you have to uh, potentially even engage in some, some triage decision making, which can be some of the hardest possible decision making that uh, could, could need to be made by, by healthcare professionals. Uh, they, there just literally isn't enough to, to, to provide to everyone who shows up who needs it. Um, here, here's another uh, chart from one of those reports that I think also um, explains very usefully how some different types of resources might go into shortage in these different, in these different stages. And so uh, you know, one type of shortage is space. You know, do, is there just a, enough physical area to treat people who come in who need care? Uh, hospital rooms, uh, expanding areas where, where patients can receive care, uh, expanding the number of ICU beds, for example. Uh, 
um, staff, are, are there sufficient people to care for all the patients that need to be cared for. Uh, sometimes this can be expanded by bringing in people from other jurisdictions. Uh, it's a little bit harder during a, a pandemic that's occurring all around the country though, because those healthcare workers might be needed at home um, at the same time. And then finally supplies. Um, we're talking about medications, medical devices, and other um, necessary um, materials that are needed to treat people. And this can be expanded by increasing manufacturing. This can be expanded by stretching um, how you use certain uh, supplies, maybe, uh, maybe you can adapt dosages and still be effective. Or um, ultimately, and in the worst case crisis scenario, perhaps you have to actually make decisions where you allocate resources to some people and not to others. And, and that's, that's of course the worst case scenario that we're trying to avoid. Now, um, I already mentioned a couple of the legal authorities that exist to expand access, including the, the strategic, strategic National Stockpile and the Defense Production Act. Um, also, you know, at the state level, uh, state emergency powers can be used both to try to uh, incentivize and expand and compel manufacturing of needed resources, but also to, um, to change licensing uh, requirements, make exceptions to allow more professionals to come in from out of state, uh, expand the scope of practice uh, to allow people to do more things uh, in, the, in the healthcare setting and things like that. There's also EMAC, which allows states to share resources with, with each other and, um, and trying to coordinate response and resource allocation uh, strategies, which was not really done very effectively uh, so far in this outbreak. Now, um, I wanna spend a few minutes that I have left here, because uh, I only have a few, uh, focusing on what happens if we end up in that worst case scenario, going to crisis standards of care, what some of the ethical and legal issues are that can come up in that context. Um, Crisis standards of care are when there's a substantial change in the usual healthcare operations and the level of care that it is possible to provide. Uh, states, um, the majority of states, I think uh, it was 34 the last time I counted, have some explicit guidance on this scenario. You know, what, what, what do you do if you have to adopt crisis standards of care? Uh, many of them have adopted their standards based on that national report from the National Academy of Sciences. A few states have gone even further and placed clear authority directly authorizing the implementation of crisis standards of care. And so um, uh, as an example, both the states of Maryland and Virginia both had provisions uh, where as a part of the emergency declaration, the governor can explicitly invoke crisis standards of care, can say that crisis standards of care are in effect. And that would clearly indicate that healthcare facilities who need to uh, engage in an alternative approach to providing resources, including uh, some, some of those triage type decisions, would be effectively on, on notice that they are authorized to do so. And, and in fact, in the Maryland statute, there is an explicit um, liability protection in place for people who follow those guidelines when an emergency has been declared. Um, obviously, uh, there are a lot of legal issues, but also a lot of ethical issues here. Um, and how you allocate resources. And so just to give you a sense, um, some of the plan, so the, the plans that are, that are in place in a lot of states prioritize resource allocation based on a couple of different types of criteria. Some of the plans try, you know, really focus on trying to save the most people possible. So a really utilitarian approach um, and, and looking at the medical prognosis. Is this patient likely to survive if they get the scarce resource? Um, at the same time, there's also a goal in these plans to preserve social functioning. How do we keep our healthcare systems working? How do we keep our other essential services functioning? Uh, so that might lead to giving priority to, to essential workers, uh, whether they be healthcare workers, um, public safety, maybe even um, in, in this case, uh, people who make our supply chain work uh, to keep getting resources uh, distributed around the country. Um, there's also a, a really important consideration for fairness and equity and how resources are distributed. Um, if you're only looking at who's likely to have the best chance of survival, you're going to be uh, explicitly or implicitly deprioritizing people who have underlying health conditions. And that's highly problematic from an ethical perspective. And it's also problematic from a legal perspective, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and, and, and you also, so, so the, the plans try to um, incorporate into their decision-making process a way to balance access across populations or, or even to prioritize greater impacted populations who might need the resource more in order to, um, to uh, survive and, 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 and 
and to, to target resources in that way. And finally, um, you can also prioritize resources based on sacrifice. So with the idea of reciprocity that you know, people who are, say, uh, putting themselves in harm's way by working with patients to treat them might also have priority to something like a vaccine if it comes out and it's safe and effective. Um, so in, in, the few, in the few minutes I have left, I want to touch on two really um, important and challenging legal issues that come up in this context. Um, one is just the issue of liability. So obviously people who are healthcare professionals working in a setting where they might have to make a decision about allocating a scarce resource, um, uh, they have concern that they may face uh, tort liability. So if, you do, if, the, if the treating uh, healthcare team decides to allocate resources towards one set of patients and not towards another, the patients who didn't receive the resource might um, argue that they violated their, their standard of care, uh, that they, they, they committed medical malpractice in not providing the resource that was available or deciding to provide it to someone else. Um, and so ordinarily, you know, the, the way the tort law functions in a, in a professional setting, uh, in the healthcare setting, is that um, the standard of care adjusts to the circumstances at hand, meaning that if there is a scarcity of resources, um, not providing the resource to everyone because you can't um, is consistent with what would be a professional standard of care. And so even without any separate um, provisions in place, uh, healthcare providers are likely to have a pretty strong defense against the malpractice claim in this context. That being said, um, especially if there is, uh, if there has been a declaration of emergency, if there's been an invocation that crisis standards of care are in place, uh, that makes the that um, that argument even stronger on, on the part of the, the healthcare professionals, uh, and so there 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 are some states that have explicitly done this, um, and as I mentioned before, um, indicated in within their emergency uh, preparedness and response laws that crisis standards of care can be invoked and that liability will be there's a liability uh, shield for providers who are following those standards. Um, and so the issue of liability, though, is a contentious one, and it's one where, um, you know, th there, there's a lot of controversy because while it's important for healthcare providers to know that they can make what they believe to be the appropriate decision without facing um, the, the, the potential for having to pay damages, uh, we also don't want to completely um, absolve uh, prov uh, healthcare providers from any kind of liability for anything that they do in this context. And so um, the, the drawing the line in the appropriate place is going to be really important in, the, in, in making sure that that's, that that's well structured. And then the last issue I wanted to mention is um, related to civil rights protection. So um, one of the big concerns I mentioned a few minutes ago in the design of a lot of these uh, resource allocation guidelines is that they, if, if they prioritize prognosis as the primary criterion for deciding whether someone gets access to a scarce resource, um, what the, the result of that can be that people who have um, underlying health conditions that make their uh, health prognosis maybe slightly less good than someone who doesn't have those underlying health conditions uh, can be deprioritized in, the, in the, uh, the set of criteria being used to make that decision. And so the impact can be that um, you know communities that are hardest hit already with higher rates of COVID-19 infection um, can also be doubly burdened by the fact that then that because of that higher rate of infection or because a specific patient might have an underlying condition, and this is particularly a, a concern for people with disabilities who might have long-term health comorbidities, but health conditions that don't necessarily affect whether they have any, have any are any less likely to survive in immediate treatment with a scarce resource. And so um, because of this concern, you know, a number of uh, challenges have been brought already to some of the state scarce resource allocation plans and crisis standards of care plans to try to um, uh, proactively get the states to update those policies so that they don't deprioritize uh, uh, people with disabilities in particular. And so there have been a, few, a number of um, um, challenges already brought uh, with uh, the Health, uh, Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights um, and uh, HHS OCR has already resolved complaints against three states um, that alleged that their crisis standards of care plans violated the Rehabilitation Act, the ADA and, and uh, Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. Um, in the way that they they 
uh, deprioritized uh, people with disabilities and people with underlying health conditions in access to scarce resources. Um, it's also notable that OCR has issued guidance uh, that explicitly says that no person should be denied medical care on the basis of stereotypes, assessments of quality of life, or judgments about a person's relative worth, including judgments about a person's worth based on the presence or uh, absence of disabilities or age. Um, and so I, I don't want to run out of time. I want to make sure there's time for at least a few questions. So I'm going to turn off the slides and uh, then I can see the, the window with the questions again, hopefully. Okay, are there, are there questions? Let me see here. I'm just scrolling up to see. Uh, if there aren't questions, since, since we have five more minutes, I could, uh, I could put the slides back on for a second and show uh, some of our recommendations, uh, which I think are, are useful to, to think about as a sort of a, a way to conclude here. So let me just do that. So in, in the report, um, Oh, so so I also I also forgot my what's next slide. Uh, so so what can we expect going forward with um, crisis standards of care and scarce resource allocation? Well, you know, we all of course hope that we will not have to to um, go down the path of having to ration resources or engage in any kind of triage or or make these kinds of tough decisions. The way we can avoid that is to actually continue to develop our systems and develop the capacity. Uh, to have reserves of, of resources that we can't anticipate that we're going to need. And uh, so, so that's one thing that we should be doing right now. We haven't done that sufficiently yet, and that's something that, that uh, should be pursued very uh, actively in the next uh, weeks and months. Um, I think we can expect legal challenges uh, and litigation uh, to occur if crisis standards of care are implemented. Um, and uh, we also... Um, have seen some, some initiatives at the federal and state levels to expand liability protection for a whole number of different groups, but including healthcare um, providers. And so the extent to which that would apply to these decisions, I think is yet untested, but uh, is likely to, to be fairly, uh, to provide a fairly broad shield for healthcare um, providers who make these kinds of decisions. I also think, and, and this isn't on the slide, but I think there's the potential for litigation that focuses on how um, uh, how the planning was done. And so while liability shields might protect the provider who makes the decision out of particular patient's access to a scarce resource, um, it's not clear that a liability shield would protect an institution from uh, facing liability for failing to stockpile resources or adequately plan in the first place. And so that's an area that has been unexplored and you know, could, be, uh, could be something that comes up in the future. Um, and then finally, we're going to see as we get uh, treatments and vaccines available that might be effective against COVID-19, um, there, there will be shortages of those supplies as well. And um, how that allocation is done and whether it's done fairly or wh whether it's done in a coordinated way uh, is something that, that certainly remains to be seen. We should be planning for that now. So I'm just going to put up here uh, some of the recommendations from the report. Um, Congress should increase its funding for and support for um, systems that allow for stockpiling necessary resources to avoid scarcity, including the strategic national stockpile and other um, support mechanisms. Um, the HHS Office of Civil Rights should continue to develop and expand their guidance on how allocation of scarce resource decisions and crisis standards of care um, can be done in a way, can, can be, how these plans can be done in a way that comport with and comply with federal anti-discrimination laws. We should, um, at the state level, be looking for state government to develop these plans to the extent that they haven't already done so, and, and to the extent that they already are in development, to clarify um, how they would be implemented in different types of scenarios. The more clarity, the better, so people know what to expect. And the, and the plan should be developed with input from communities who are likely to be most affected by uh, shortages. Uh, in addition, um, having you know, clear protocols for how crisis standards of care might be invoked at a state level 
uh, I think that approach is useful. It's something that a few, a few states have done. That Maryland model is an interesting one to look at and states should consider that. Uh, states should also um, review their plans to make sure they're consistent with federal and state anti-discrimination laws. And then the, the final one I'll mention, well, actually, there, there are two more that I think I'll mention really quickly. One is that um, legislatures should adopt uh, liability shields for healthcare professionals related specifically to the allocation decisions um, so that individual healthcare providers don't face liability for these decisions. Um, this was a tough recommendation to come to. I, I went back and forth on this personally for a long time and I, I, because I, I don't believe that liability shields more broadly are, are advisable because I think uh, um, it, it takes away uh, incentives for people to take protective measures to, you know, in workplaces and other settings. But I think in this specific setting, it's it's probably warranted and, and appropriate. Um, and then the final thing, I, uh, one one really good model uh, that I wanted to highlight, and it's in the recommendations of the report. Uh, the state of Michigan, uh, which is my home state, um, came out with an executive order um, in a, a few months ago. I think it was in either May or June, which explicitly um, uh, stated that uh, at medical allocation decision making could not be based upon uh, any of the following categories. And, and you can see it on the screen there. So stereotypes regarding age, color, criminal history, disability, ethnicity, familial status, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That long list there. It's a very, it's a very extensive and comprehensive list. I think this is a good model and that language I think is really useful and states should consider that in, in their, their strategies as well. So, Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Let me stop the share and see if there was any if there are any additional comments or questions before we end. I think actually we might be out of time, so maybe it's too late. Maybe maybe I filibustered too long. Yes, actually, I apologize this is the host. If, if there were questions. Yeah, that's all right. Um, this is the host. Yes, we are um, at time. I want to thank you all three of you for an excellent presentation. Um, and that concludes this session. I'll ask the attendees to please press the button underneath the video to take an evaluation of this session for us. And thank you for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> See you next year in Baltimore. <laughs>